Good evening, everyone. This is Nicole Wicke from Myeloma Patients Europe. Thank you all for joining us this evening for this webinar um, that's part of the um, uh, Myeloma Patients Europe um, Annual General Meeting Masterclass. So today's webinar is focused on minimal residual disease in multiple myeloma and AL amyloidosis. Paula, maybe just before you get started, um, yeah. just want to um, let the participants know that um, so the webinar today will be um, uh, approximately uh, 45 minutes of presentation from Paula, our um, um, exceptional guest speaker today. Thank you so much for taking the time to run through this content with us today, Paula. So we'll have about 45 minutes of presentation, followed by about approximately 15 to 20 minutes of questions and answers. Um, so if you guys um, have any questions throughout the presentation to be asked um, at the end, you can feel free to use the um, questions um, option in the GoToWebinar um, menu, and you can send your questions over to me. Um, or you also can use the raise hand function and you can raise your hand and then I can um, unmute you later on in the call and um, and you can pose your questions to Paula. So just that everyone is um, takes a look and finds out where they can raise their hand and how, where they can type their questions in um, and we will address all the questions at the end. So. My name is uh, Paula van Hennig. I'm an alternate CGMP member um, for the Dutch um, agency, and um, which means that I'm one of the two representatives in the European Committee for Human and Medicinal Products. So we discuss and decide about marketing authorizations for uh, medicinal products for human use uh, to the Euro for the European market. Uh, today I will talk about minimal residual disease in multiple myeloma and in amyloid light chain uh, amyloidosis. I will go to the next slide. See how that works. Yeah. So um, on the second slide, you see the outline of the presentation of the day. I will first talk about uh, normal blood cell production. I will briefly touch upon multiple myeloma, the disease itself, as well as on amyloid light chain amyloidosis. I will discuss MRD, so not um, minimal residual disease, how it can be used, how it is measured, and what it is that we do not know about MRD. Uh, I will also touch upon EMIS position on the use of MRD in multiple myeloma trials, and I will refer to the regulatory guidance as is available by the FDA. So on the next slide, slide number three, there's a, a graph, a very nice drawing actually, of normal blood cell production which in adult life takes place in the bone marrow, where the hematopoietic stem cell, you can see that the, the cell in the middle of the, of the graph, um, which is actually the mother of all mature blood cells, um, produces every day uh, and every, every day of the week and in, in every year, um, mature blood cells like the red blood cells and the platelets and the white blood cells, including the lymphocytes and the granulocytes. And this uh, hematopoietic stem cell and, and the, the progeny of that is um, kept very well in a very nice house, if you like. Um, it's called the bone marrow microenvironment, which is formed by the osteoblasts, the stromal cells, sorry, the stromal cells and the adipocytes. Um, in case of um, malignant um, uh, hematological malignancies, something goes wrong. Uh, in one of these cells, uh, from, from varying from hematopoietic stem cells in case of leukemia to the more mature cells, so the B cells in case of uh, multiple myeloma or, amylo uh, or the amyloidosis disease. So on multiple myeloma, uh, some facts about epidemiology. Um, it is a rare and incurable disease that accounts for approximately 10% of all hematological malignancies. And the incidence in Europe is four and a half to six per 100,000 people per year, with a median age diagnosis between 65 and 70 years. The course of multiple myeloma is highly variable and clinical behavior is heterogeneous. And in general, the disease is characterized by a chronic phase lasting several years and an aggressive terminal phase. And most patients with uh, this disease need multiple lines of therapy. So, on the pathology of the disease, on slide five, um, multiple myeloma is characterized by marrow plasma cytomas, 
which is a complicated name for plasma cell tumors, and an overproduction of antibodies or immunoglobulins. These can be of uh, various or, uh, types. So you have IgG, IgA, IgG, or IgE. Now we'll get to, back to that in the next slide. Or um, by an overproduction of Ben's Jones protein, which is a monoclonal copper or lambda and copper or lambda light change. So that's only a part of an immunoglobulin. And important is that it, it is all of one uh, type. Uh, so one patient, one uh, one cell that actually goes wrong and it creates um, a monoclonal disease. Uh, and this coincides with impairment of the production of normal antibodies. On the right side of the, of the slide, you see uh, the structure of an immunoglobulin uh, with the dark yellow part with the orange tip being the heavy chain uh, and the the, the light yellow with orange tip being the, li the light chain part of the immunoglobulin, and these are to, they, these are uh, connected together with the particular types of uh, chemical uh, chemical uh, bridges. Um, the exact mechanism of why a myeloma cell does not differentiate is not known, but the disease is associated with chromosomal changes and clonal evolution. Uh, and on the right side of the, of the, of the graph, you see um, a smear uh, of a bone marrow aspirate puncture, and the cells are stained with a, with a particular dye and shows you that the, the, the big cells that you see here, the blue ones with the, with the purple nucleus, those are the myeloma cells. And, and this, uh, normally, the, this kind of cells are in a bone marrow, but not ju just as many in case of, uh, of uh, multiple myeloma. If we go to the next slide, um, a little bit more about antibodies or the or immunoglobulins. Um, left side again, the picture of the structure of the uh, immunoglobin with uh, the dark yellow is the the heavy chain of the of the uh, immunoglobulin, and the light yellow is the this is the light chain. Both of you know both what you can see here is that both uh, both of the heavy and the light chain there are two. Um, two of them in, in one immunoglobulins. And here you can see that IgE, IgE, and IgD look very similar in terms of structure. However, IgM has, is, is composed of five separate immunoglobulin molecules, which you would normally recognize as IgG, E, or D, so the same structure, but then five of them. And IgE, IgA, sorry, is connected making um uh, making a sort of a twin uh, immunoglobulin and this pro and these uh, um and this isotype is uh, normally secreted and can be found in saliva or in uh, in the gut uh, a Benz Jones protein is an immunoglobulin uh, con um, consisting of only the light chain, either the kappa or the lambda. So this is only this part of the immunoglobulin. And of that light chain, you have two isoforms, as you may understand, the kappa or the lambda. You cannot see it um, very easily. You should look at the, at the amino acid sequence so in very much detail in order to see uh, the difference between kappa or lambda. On slide number six, it, uh, I will tell you something about clonal evolution, because I, I re, if you may remember, I dis, mentioned that my, multiple myeloma is a monoclonal disease. So, but how does it, how does it happen? Um, so you have an, a, a particular, um, uh, you have a B cell in a particular state of differentiation. And at some point um, during the course of life, um, by accident or by external factors like irradiation, the cell gets a mutation or translocation, which means that the, that the chromosomes are um, reshuffled, which normally doesn't happen, but sometimes it happens by accident, like I said, or by an external factor. And that um, makes the cell um, uh, proliferate faster or give it a survival advantage. And that means that it can um, that there will be more of those particular cells in comparison to the rest of the, um, the in comparison to the other um, cells in in the bone marrow. In the end, you get a, an increase in the bulk of the disease. This is normally associated by uh, getting the, of the cell getting additional mutations, and that also often coincides with differences in the micro environment because the cell starts producing particular. Um, growth factors or other kinds of uh, substances which either stimulate the immune system or um, um, 
or uh, inhibit the activity of the immune system. And that together, so both the changes occurring in the, in the B cell itself, as well as the effect that it has on the microenvironment, cause the disease to to develop uh, in over the course of the time. And in the end, uh, there is often the emergence of the high risk state. Um, and that is, of course, a very, uh, has a very uh, grave prognosis. So it's important to understand that in case of multiple myeloma, it's not only about the B cell that is, uh, that is changing over the time and getting more and more aggressive, but also the environment is affected by that. And that, uh, and those two together, um, um, lead to the type of disease that multiple myeloma actually is. If we go to the next slide, this is slide number eight, there's actually the same information and differently um, depicted. If you look at the middle of the slide, you can see the changes from the B cell to, in the end, multiple myeloma and the extra medullary disease. So that's, that's part of the high risk sta stage with the changing in the cells occurring, leading to clonal competition and also effects on the tumor microenvironment. And, um, like, like I also just explained, is that during the, 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 the disease developing, there's more and more remodeling of the tumor microenvironment, which in the end also contributes to the disease being there. So on the one hand, this doesn't sound good, of course. Um, on the other hand, you can also so you can also turn it around and saying that okay, because it's not only about the multiple myeloma itself itself, but also about the microenvironment. You can say okay, these we need to we need to um, uh, target both aspects in order to have an efficient um, uh, efficient treatment of the disease. So on the one hand, we can target um, the immune cells uh, that surround the multiple myeloma uh, cells, so we do immunomodulation, as we call it, uh, in combination with uh, uh, targeting the multiple myeloma cell cells, for instance, by increasing, sorry, this is not, should not be here, but uh, increasing the cell death, so the cells going to die, and, and, um, um, and the cells uh, being, um, uh, targeted by uh, inhibiting the proteasome pathway, and the proteasome pathway is is a is a, a sort of sort of the, the the garbage disposal mechanism of a cell. And if you inhibit that, the cells get sort of um, you know overwhelmed with the amount of garbage in the cell, and that causes also the cell to go into programmed cell death, so die. Um, and of course, like I said, uh, targeting the microenvironment can also help. So you, you can see that, and I think that is also recognizable in, in the treatment of multiple myeloma. Uh, it's important to target the various aspects contributing to the existence of the disease and the development of the disease in order to have uh, to increase the chances of a, of, an, of a good response to the treatment. Next slide. Um, a little bit about. Um, Amyloid light chain amyloidosis, the pathology of the presentation. I'm now on slide 10. Um, the normal plasma cells produce antibodies that fight infections. Um, if a plasma cell becomes cancerous, it may produce extra light chains. These light chains circulate in the bloodstream and can deposit in organs throughout the body, causing organ damage. And this is what is causing the amyloid light chain amyloidosis. So most common organs affected are um, the heart, kidney, nerves, gut, skin, soft tissue, the tongue, and that, of course, causes the symptoms. And the presentation, because of um, the, the various organs to, can be, various organs can be involved, the presentation is diverse and can vary from vague symptoms, such as weight loss or fatigue, to kidney failure, heart failure, and liver failure. The incidence in Europe is 5 to 13 cases per million per patients, sorry, per million persons per year, which is, which is really rare and the median age is 60 years. On slide 11, um, there's an, uh, some information on the pathology. Um, there's a picture of a uh, heart muscle. Um, on the left side, you see a normal heart. On the right side, you see a heart muscle uh, from a patient that suffers from amyloidosis. On the left side, the, the pink circles actually with the, with the purple dots, those are the, the muscle cells 
um, in the heart. You see that they are very close together and uh, rather well organized. On the right side, there the heart cells are pink and the, the purple, um, sorry, the, the light purple staining is the amyloid. And what you can see is that the structure of, of, the, of, the, of the muscle is completely uh, different, um, not to say that the structure is gone. And you can imagine, of course, it has an immediate function, uh, sorry, immediate, uh, immediate reflection on the function of, of the heart. Um, so this is the, this is the, the, the immediate consequences of, of uh, um, overproduction of um, the light chains in, in case of amyloidosis. So the treatment of amyloidosis has two goals, uh, improve the function of the involved organs and decrease the production of the abnormal light chains. And the most effective treatment is autologous bone marrow transplantation with, uh, so with stem cell rescue and other treatments involve therapies similar to those used in, in um, uh, multiple myeloma. On slide 13, um, it is about the difference and overlap between the two diseases. And uh, considering the pathophysiology of both diseases, you can um, understand that these diseases are closely related uh, because they're both um, a disease in which identical clones of antibody producing cells grow rapidly. In multiple myeloma, the main problem is the growth of abnormal cells in the bone marrow, while in amyloidosis, the main problem is the buildup of the light change produced by the abnormal cells. And, and this causes also, of course, the, different, the differences in presentation. Um, but indeed, there can be overlap between, overlap between the two diseases, and uh, 10 to 50% of the patients with multiple myeloma may also develop overt uh, uh, amyloid light chain amyloidosis. Now we come to the topic of MRD. Uh, so minimal residual disease is the name given to small numbers of cancer cells from the bone marrow that remain in the person during treatment or after treatment when the patient is in remission. It is the major cause of relapsing blood cancers, including multiple myeloma and leukemia. And ultra-sensitive molecular biology uh, tests can measure minute levels of cancer cells in tissue samples, sometimes as low as one cancer cell in a million normal cells. So how to measure this? So this is shown in on slide 15. Um, this is a, a graph um, showing the development actually of uh, MRD measure, measuring from 1995 already to 2015. So in the beginning there was G-bending really looking at the chromosomes and uh, since a few years uh, there's a next generation sequencing, uh, which of course gives you a very high level of uh, sensitivity. So. Um, the thing that is not on this uh, in, this, in this graph, but is uh, used in, 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 uh, in the clinical trials, is next generation flow cytometry, um, which means that by use by means of uh, four to six markers, but it can be up to ten to twelve markers, um, cells can be um, detected among many other uh, cells um, to see if there is indeed MRD, yes or no. So that is, it's not as sensitive as next generation sequencing, uh, but it can be uh, sometimes quicker. It is important to note, though, that each test method has its own limitation. And what, in addition, what is, what is really actually needed is that because MRD is repetitively measured in bone marrow, there's the need to, uh, develop, to develop possibilities to test in peripheral blood, because uh, that would, of course, be of much uh, comfort to uh, patients. Next slide, please. So on the definitions on slide 16, definitions for depth of, depth of response and MRD. So um, in the light blue text, you see um, complete remission, stringent complete remission, and uh, next generation flow cytometry and DNA sequencing. And on, in, the, in the black letters, you can see how sensitive these methods are. So. Um, just by looking at uh, cells from uh, from bone marrow, you can see. Um, um, so, we, sorry, the definition of a complete remission is a one cancer cell in in a thousand. While by means of next generation flow cytometry, you end up in one cancer cell per hundred thousand. And in next generation DNA sequencing, you can detect one cancer cell in in a million cells. So, um, very different uh, sensitivity. 
Um, this the same information is actually slow shown in this in this graph, with on the x-axis the time and on the y-axis the depth in, in in remission. So at some point we start with a patient with a certain amount of tumor cells, and if this patient is treated um, uh, but does not respond, um, then the number of cells increases. If the patient responds a little bit, not too much, you end up with sta stable disease, and if the patient responds um, but a little bit more than stable disease, um, then we talk about a partial responder. So the dark blue um, gives the level of uh, tumor bulk under which we talk about complete responders. And in within that, that, that part of complete responders, um, there is also the level of a response that um, refers to com having a complete MRD. And this patient um, will probably have the longest um, uh, time before the disease um, uh, returns. Uh, and, um, and of course, what we all, all hope, would hope for that it does not. But that is, of course, um, very um, rare in, in multiple myeloma, as it is in principle and not curative disease. Um, so this, this explains these slides explain the, 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 the principles. If we go then to slide 18, so how can we use then uh, MRD? In principle, we can use it to determine whether treatment has eradicated the myeloma or whether traces remain. We can compare the anti-disease activity of different treatments and we can monitor patient remission status. Also, we can detect the recurrence of the myeloma and choosing the treatment that will best meet its needs. Um, if there's a debate on uh, whether MRD can be used to start, when to start next treatment. So if the disease is, is re resurfacing, um, whether that would be the time to treat already or it would be better to wait. There's debate about that. If we go to slide 19, this shows you actually the effect of having an MRD uh, being MRD negative or positive following treatment in relation to progression-free survival or overall survival. So for both graphs, there's time in years on the x-axis and the percentage on the left graph on the y-axis is percentage of progression-free survival and on the right side is percentage of survival. Um, CTD and CVAD are different, different treatments, um, but if you compare the, the red and the green uh, lines and the uh, um, purple and the pink, you can see that um, as soon as there is MRD negativity, then the, pro then the chances of a progression, uh, having a longer progression-free survival is higher as compared to when there is MRD positivity, so red and, uh, red and, and green lines. So, that's, that's an, uh, so this shows that if you ha are MRD positive, the chances that you have that the disease will return is higher as compared to when the disease is, is not there, so when you have an MRD negative. So the, t the time to that it resurfaces, I should say it like that. And that, that same correlation you also see in overall survival, that it, it, it's, it's less strong, but it's, of course there are often more treatments which affect in the end overall, overall survival. Um, next slide. So what is it that we do not know about MRD? In principle, well, the list is quite long. Um, we do not quite know what the optimal timing for MRD assessment is during and after treatment. Also, we do not quite know what the meaning of MRD negative is in specific subgroups, uh, for instance, the high-risk cytogenetics, so whether there's a different meaning. Uh, and also whether we can use MRD to alter therapy, so in duration of maintenance, change of treatment, add agents, those kind of things. And in relation to, um, to regulatory approval, a regular drug approval, we don't, we're not quite sure whether we can use MRD as a valid endpoint. And I will talk about this in, in, the, in the upcoming slides. But because in the upcoming slides, I talk a little bit about what current position is on the use of MRD in multiple myeloma in, in, in regulatory, for regulatory purposes. So this far, uh, available studies have reported a correlation between MRD and PFS and OS. That's what I showed you on, on the graphs, I tried to explain. If something is not clear, we can go back there. Um, 
Currently, it's not possible to define what order of magnitude for MRD negativity would be needed to be associated with a minimal clinical relevant effect in terms of OS and PFS. So this is rather complicated, but what it does, what does it mean is that we do not know how how much MRD, um, how deep your response would be in, in terms of MRD in order to have a certain uh, amount of um, PFS or OS benefit. Uh, and I will get to that a little bit uh, late in, in, in the upcoming slides, a little bit more in the upcoming slides. Um, so what we think is that the surrogacy of MRD, because that's what we are actually looking for, um, of MRD for overall survival and PFS should be investigated using appropriate statistical techniques, using a collaborative effort to maximize the inclusion of trials, um, because one trial is not enough. Um, so, in the absence of properly conducted validation study, that's how you call them, uh, any assumed extrapolation of effects from MRD to overall survival or PFS should be carefully justified on a case-by-case -case basis. So, if we, if we use, this means that if we use MRD, we, we should be sure that it can be done on that, in, in that particular case so that it actually means something. Um, so, the example that I would like to refer to is that um, often we say one of, one of the texts we have once written is that we call it dramatic effects on MRD. Um, so to increase the likelihood of a positive effect on a clinically relevant outcome, we being, being PFS or OS, uh, should be shown. But then, of course, we can talk about what is really dramatic. And like I just said, this should be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and this is all um, at least as long as trial level surrogacy has not been established. So what is that actually? I will show you in the next slide. So this slide explains patient level versus trial level surrogacy. So patient level surrogacy means that if you're a B, if, if a patient is MRD negative or positive, this predicts um, a favorable or not effect on PFS or OS. So if you're MRD negative, uh, then you know that has a that that the ch the, the time to um, that disease returns is going to be longer in comparison to patients that uh, are MRD positive, and it's also such a relation with overall survival. Um, trial level surrogacy is that the treatment effect on MRD reliably predicts the effect size, so how long PFS will be or how long the overall survival benefit will be. And this is also explained in these two graphs. On the left side, you see patient level surrogacy and on the right side, trial, uh, trial level surrogacy. Um, on the XX MRD, on the YX PFS OS. So for trial one, you can see that for this patient, the the MRD difference um, gives you a long PFS OS, and within this trial, this, this correlates. And so, if you have a shorter, sorry, lower MRD level, um, uh, MRD level, then the PFS is uh, sh shorter. So you can see that there's a correlation, and the same is true for trial two. However, uh, in order to have the Quantitative correlation between MRD and PFS, you should correlate this among uh, different trials um, because you can see that the circumstances in trial one for those patients correlate, but not, uh, in, not for uh, um, when you combine trial one and trial two. Well, it is the case when you combine in, uh, the data for trial one, two, three, and four, at least with the uh, results obtained um, in, the, in these trials. So this type of analysis can help us understand, um, or can help us um, show, can, can show that MRD reliably predicts the effect size of PFS and OS, and that is what we need in order to have MRD as um, an endpoint to uh, be used in, 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 in uh, regulatory approval. So on the use of MRD in amyloidosis, um, there's indeed scientific interest, so that's, that's for sure. Uh, and the limitations that 
uh, I've described for multiple myeloma are also there for amyloidosis. Uh, also, it should be uh, noted that it, there are tr different treatment goals uh, for this disease as compared to multiple myeloma. The reduction of the plasma cell clone is not the only goal of the, of the treatment. So, because indeed for this disease, there's the improvement uh, of the function of the involved organs and uh, the, the decrease of the production of the abnormal light chains. So additional, additional um, goals. Um, this link shows you to, of lead, would lead you to the regulatory guidance of the FDA. And there's this, the, the similar position uh, as EMA currently has um, for the uh, use of MRD uh, for regulatory approval. And um, I must say that there has been a lot of debate, and uh, probably you are aware of that as well, um, with, within uh, regulatory agencies and within uh, um, those agencies and EMA and within the EMA about uh, the use of MRD for regulatory approval. Uh, and what we have learned is that uh, during the, the course of this year, there will be additional data available, probably uh, at um, probably able to show trial level surrogacy for MRD, which would, would of course uh, be uh, very welcome, both for uh, patients, uh, physicians, as well as um, uh, us as regulatory authority, because that would indeed enable uh, MRD to be used as an early endpoint in clinical trials, and that would speed up the drug development, which of course is what we would all want. Um, and with that, I think uh, I want to thank you for your uh, attention. I hope it's clear. Please ask any question you like, and we can go back to the particular slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. That was a really exceptional presentation, um, really informative. Um, so for those on the line, if you have any questions, you can feel free to use the raise hand option, or you also can type your questions in the question box, and I can pose them to Paula on your behalf. Um, so our first question is from Hans. Hans, I'll just unmute your line, and you can go ahead. Thank you, uh, Nicole, and thank you very much for the insightful uh, presentation uh, with a lot of context, uh, so we would <laughs> understand the concept of MRD uh, much better, uh, although for me it was very interesting to, to see what uh, uh, in, in what context this discussion is happening around MRD. I was wondering, um, uh, we only talk within the, uh, the, this area of myeloma, myeloma doses, um, and uh, recommendations uh, for new treatments about MRD endpoints. Why didn't we have the discussion around uh, complete remission or very good partial response, for example? Are, uh, aren't they also uh, predicting overall survival in the end? Yes, that is a, that's a very good question. And I think uh, with, uh, with complete response, you would have uh, as far as I know, you would have the same discussion there. Um, so you would very much, um, there you also understand that if you have a complete remission, you're, um, for, for, for you as a patient, as an individual patient, this is, uh, this is very good news, uh, right? The, the question is that it, it, it is very difficult to uh, predict um, how, how long the disease will, um, will be under control. And also, it's very difficult to say how, how long your um, survival will be. Uh, so, in principle, you would have the same discussion uh, there, I believe. Uh, but I don't know why we didn't have it. I mean, that's that's. I, sorry, I can't answer that question. Uh, that part of the question. Okay, thank you. I, I was just wondering uh, because we have this, this um, intense discussion around the position of MRD, and uh, one of the things we uh, uh, we as a patient uh, often are worried about uh, MRD is of course a, absolutely an improvement in the technique of diagnostics uh, to to look at that detail of of the remaining disease, but. Um, uh, on the other hand, when it would be approved, wouldn't that be uh, encouraging the pharmaceutical companies uh, in the end to uh, create uh, also in the induction states very heavy uh, treatments 
to reach MRD instead of uh, a long-term uh, um, health situation. So uh, is that taken into account too? Can you please clarify a little bit your question? Because um, you were one. You 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 would say that. Um, so um, uh, what I what I meant maybe I didn't uh, uh, explain it uh, what I me uh, meant that well, but um, uh, when at some some moment the CBT or uh, the EMA or or FDA would approve. Uh, MRD as an uh, an endpoint to recommend uh, recommend a new treatment. Um, isn't there a risk that uh, when uh, we uh, have a situation like that, that in the end pharmaceutical companies will um, focus on MRD, uh, so um, they will hit the disease as hard as possible to reach your, that MRD instead of looking at uh, long-term effects of it. Yeah, sorry. Yes, uh, sorry. Now I understand. Um, so what I it is very good that you raised this because I should have explained it actually. So the the the, uh, as, the fact that you reach MRD should always be confirmed by uh, PFS data and overall survival data, uh, and at least there should be no detriment for overall survival. Uh, it's not a myeloma. So uh, if your your fear will be that indeed companies will develop drugs that are very toxic to reach MRD, then they can be approved. But in the end, uh, people are, are um, actually um, getting very sick because of the adverse events or even um, have uh, increased chance to uh, to die because of the treatment, because of the toxicity, then that's of course not of any value for no one. So that's why um, um, MRD data should always be confirmed by data of uh, PFS and overall survival. So that means that, that uh, probably the, the regulators will recommend uh, MRD as an endpoint in combination with overall survival and quality yes, of life data. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So MRD will be used as an early endpoint. So what they can get is, an, is for instance, um, a conditional approval based on MRD, and then they, the uh, specific obligation, as you call it. So there, there's a requirement that they, sh they provide PFS and overall progression-free survival and overall survival at the latest stage as soon as available. That's true. And of course, there, this is surrounded by specific recommendations or agreements that they cannot stop the, the trial early because you should have enough events uh, for over survival and PFS to be informative. Um, so be able to say something about what the effect is on, on, on those parameters. True. Okay, thank you. You're thank, you. Thank, thank you, Hans. Um, so I have a couple additional questions that have, um, that have come through, Paula. Um, so first is, is a question with two parts. Um, so first is, is MRD measurement able to be performed in you know, most conventional um, hematology um, clinics, so in most hospital settings? So that's part one. And then second part is whether the price of MRD testing would maybe be something that would have a um, an, an impact on whether or not hematologists would utilize MRD in their regular practice. Okay, thank you. That's clear. Um, um, so, so, um, in, so it depends with regard to which type of MRD testing is available where. Uh, I think um, what often, at least as far as I know, and I, I, and I know a little bit about a Dutch, Dutch situation, I'm not how it is, I don't know how it's organized in other countries uh, that well, is that um, there are um, um, a few central labs in which there is the next generation sequencing done, done and also the, flow, the, the, the next generation flow cytometry, so with, uh, with up to 212 markers. And that, that's done in, in um, centralized uh, laboratories. And um, let me see if I... Um, so, so to answer the question directly, uh, not every uh, MRD 
uh, testing method will be available in every uh, hospital. But that uh, doesn't mean that uh, it is unreachable. Uh, the, uh, what I understand, at least again for the Dutch situation, that the hematologists send the samples to the central laboratories, await and await the the, the, the test results. Um, whether the MRD testing price would impact the availability, yes, that, that's a difficult question, at least for me to answer. I must say, um, in principle. You can look at it from a bigger, uh, as a bigger picture, um, because if you would know if you if if the MRD, sorry, if if the disease is is resurfacing, as I call it, then um, that's very very valuable information because you, you can discuss with the patient whether to start treatment uh, now or later, uh, and that of course can uh, in the end uh, also contribute to uh, lower lower costs. Um, so, I, I, I must say that uh, further than that, I, I find it very difficult to answer uh, answer this question. I, I would not. I would assume and hope it doesn't, but I, of course, am not sure to talk about whole of Europe. Okay, thank you, Paula. Um, so th another question is really around. So for now. Um, the current um, approach to MRD testing is really reliant on um, bone marrow aspiration, um, with this being potentially the gold standard. Um, do you think that this will be, um, so based on your knowledge, is, do you think that this will be maintained as the as the, the high standard? Is there any possibility for there being a, a blood test available, for instance, in future to be able to test for MRD? Yes, yeah, so that, that's also a very good question, um, and I think indeed the bone marrow will remain, bone marrow aspiration will remain the golden standard until um, peripheral blood, um, the detection of MRD in peripheral blood has shown to be uh, as sensitive and as specific as um, the MRD testing in the bone marrow. So there, there have to be validation studies. So that is um, that is a, the next level effort, I would say, that uh, needs to be done by uh, both uh, the companies as well as the uh, in the uh, assume in collaboration with uh, academia. Okay. It will not be it will not be short. It will not be soon. I must say sorry. It will not be yeah. Soon. Yeah. But there are, are there currently blood um, so peripheral blood assays that are under investigation that you know of. You can do next generation sequencing on your blood. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, technically that's possible, but you have to show that the correlations that you see in the bone marrow are, are similar um, in the peripheral blood, and that has so. So you have to do um, in in several trials. You have to show the same pattern in bone marrow and blood, and people just need need to do that. Okay. So technically, it would be possible. Great. Maybe that's something that patient advocates can advocate for in future research. Yes, of course. And of course, there's the advantage for not only for patients, but it's also the advantage for um, um, for uh, companies as well, right? And, and also for uh, physicians as well. I think it's a triple win situation if you can do it by peripheral blood. It is less. Um, it costs less um, effort for um, for the physician to do. To collect peripheral blood, you can do it much more frequently, which is interested uh, of interest for for companies as well, and uh, for the patient. I mean, there's a lot, big difference between drawing blood uh, and uh, um, getting bone marrow, getting a bone marrow aspirate. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, another question is around. Um, MRD and, and with the aim of MRD as a surrogate endpoint um, with having the aim to speed up drug development. Um, so the question is around which stage of development would be would be sped up per se. Um, so it, it seems that MRD data would be used in conjunction with trial data um, so there would be still considerable time given to trials to test for toxicities and side effects is what the the um, the asker has put 
um, to add some context. So, yes, yeah, it's a very good question as well. So, I mean, which aspect um, of job development would be we speed up? And I think, um, I think it would be the part. So the basis. Um, so, so the the basis for regulatory approval would be in in whatever line of treatment uh, that would be. Of course, depends on if, if if surrogacy has been established in 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 the different settings, which of course are clearly there uh, in in multiple myeloma treatment. Um, but and and it, it it the question touches upon a very important point, of course, and that's the safety, because I mean, a drug can be very efficacious. But of course, it can also be very toxic in that you have to have sufficient exposure, as you call it. So sufficient number of patients should be exposed to the drug for a sufficient uh, duration in order to get a, a good feel about the safety profile. Um, and there are guidelines for that. Uh, and of course, if you um, have a drug approval based on an early endpoint, that would uh, that would uh, that would you. Know, bring about a risk that you have an indication that it works but not sufficient safety information uh, there's so there's that is indeed something that we should be you know uh, be uh, on the lookout for that that, that, that doesn't happen um, of course um, it takes um, several months in order to see if patients uh, respond and also uh, you need to have quite a, a number of patients to actually you know com get a good feel of oh Paula I think your audio is cut out can you hear me now yes I can hear you now oh sorry yeah, no I, I got disconnected. No, sorry. That's um, fine. That's fine. So uh, it, it is really about the balance between efficacy and safety. That is, of course, clear. That needs to be um, established and confirmed. Yeah, of course. Um, well, I think you were able to really stress that point. So, um, but I, we've wrapped up the webinar now. So I've um, okay. sent everybody off for the evening. Um, so thank okay. you once again so much for a really great presentation. Have a really nice evening. Um, we really appreciate that you can come and, and do this webinar and, and um, really regret that we couldn't have done this face to face at the AGM. Uh, would have been great to have you with us. But as always, you've explain this stuff really brilliantly so we appreciate your your time and okay your input. <laughs> you're welcome